Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. All right. Well, I think you know this, but I always let people explain because, you know, technology people want to know why the heck would you pick one over the other? So please enlighten us. Why Star Wars? Because lightsabers are awesome. <laughs> that's great. That is like a really awesome answer. I love it. Lightsaber. That's the first one that we had, that lightsabers are awesome. So I love it. Perfect, perfect, perfect answer. Hello, my name is Lisa Roger from Otimo, and I want to welcome you to the CIO podcast. Well, welcome everybody to our next podcast. We are very excited today to have somebody from Wisconsin. We have Nate Melvey. He is the Vice President and Chief Information Officer uh, for Dairyland Power Cooperative. And he joined about eight years ago in 2016. And as the Vice President and CIO, Nate is responsible for leading the strategy, the development and implementation of IT initiatives and systems. Um, he is also involved with the business operations and strategy. Um, Nate, he went and got his uh, Bachelor's of Science of Information uh, Systems from University of Wisconsin La Crosse and a Master's, an MBA, uh, with an emphasis on technology and training from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. And then he was not done, went and got his PhD in Information Systems from Nova South Nova Southeastern University, specializing in information security and telecommunications. Um, he also earned a certificate of management and excellence from Harvard Business School and completed the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth or Dartmouth uh, Business Engagement for the Security Professionals Executive Program. He's an active member in his community. Nate is a fire chief of the town of Campbell Fire Department and serves on the board of directors of the Wisconsin State Fire Chiefs Association. He's a recipient of the University of Wisconsin La Crosse's RADA Distinguished Alumni Award. Um, prior to joining Dairyland, he also uh, led the information security for Intersol uh, Rand in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And he also has held other positions in global telecommunications, engineering and architecture firms, data communication, information technology for train and American standards companies. Wow, what a background. This is going to be interesting. Uh, Nate, welcome. I'm so glad you're here today. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks for having me today. Oh, this is going to be awesome. Hey, so if you're not from Wisconsin and you don't know what Dairyland Power Cooperative is all about, can you tell everybody, you know, what is your mission? What do you guys do? Sure. So Dairyland is a uh, generation and transmission cooperative here in the upper Midwest. Uh, we serve 24 member cooperatives in Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, Illinois, and Iowa. And we serve uh, approximately 700,000 people uh, through our utilities. So we're a system of utilities that work together. Dairyland provides the generation and transmission. Um, we, we serve our members with an economy of scale. Um, our members are our owners, so we exist to provide service for them. And um, we've, we've had an interesting history. We were formed uh, coming out of the New Deal in the 40s. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the cooperative movement electrified rural America, and we're still here today providing critical services as some of those areas aren't so rural anymore. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's 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 interesting. I think you're our first uh, power cooperative that we've had on the podcast. So um, I'm excited to dig in a little bit. And what does that mean? Um, but as you know, we always like to break the ice a little bit and let people get to know you just a little bit better uh, by doing a little rapid fire. So you know the rules, right? You're, you know what, uh, how we play this game. So um, I'm going to give you two choices. Um, and then we're going to, you're going to quickly give a response without explanation um, and do your best uh, to, to hold on to the next question. So are you ready? Bring it on. Okay, great. Hamburgers or hot dogs? Hamburgers. Texting or calling? Texting. Mac or PC? PC. Summer or winter? Oh, summer. Printing or cursive? Cursive. All right, on-prem or in the cloud? Wow. Um, Early riser or night out? Night out. 
plastic or paper? Plastic. Loud or soft music? Loud. Shoes on or off in the house? Off. Drama or musical? Musical. Bland or spicy? Spicy. Sunrise or sunset? Sunset. Ford or Chevy? Chevy. Fiction or nonfiction? Fiction. Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. All right. Well, I think you know this, but I always let people explain because, you know, technology people want to know. Why the heck would you pick one over the other? So, please enlighten us. Why Star Wars? Because lightsabers are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That is like a really awesome answer. I love it. Lightsab that's the first one that we have, that lightsabers are awesome. So, I love it. Perfect, perfect, perfect answer. Well, great. So as you know, we're all about digital transformation um, this year. That's our topic for the year. And I think every organization has either been through one, in the middle of one, or about to uh, em embark on one. And so we're, we're really enjoying our conversations this year with professionals like yourself that have been through the trenches um, and have, um, you know, really led the way. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll, and I'm sure we will learn a lot from you today and and uh, sharing your uh, wisdom um, and your experience. And, and when you think about that, you know, starting at the top with, with strategy and, you know, and your role as the CIO within an organization, um, you know, how does that play out and how do you see, you know, yourself as the CIO and what, and, and how can you influence and, and how does that play out for you, Nate? What, how does, how, what are some of your best practices to, to get things going? Yeah, so it, that's a very interesting question for me because I not only um, this was my first role as a CIO, I was also the first CIO at my company. And so I kind of carved out a place um, to do those things that hadn't been done here before. And so I think it begins with dialogue and it begins with a, an honest conversation about the goals of the company, but not just your current goals. It's where, where does the company want to position itself in the future? Um, one thing that's interesting about the, the industry that I'm in is that we're going through a transformation and a shift and the business models are changing. And so that conversation has, has been as much about what kind of a business are we in the future and um, what kind of systems should we implement to meet those needs and truly what, what are those requirements. And so, you know, it really starts with your mission, mission vision values, your goals, values, um, and then where do you fit in the world? And how do you take this massive toolbox that we can bring as technologists and align it to uh, make an impact in those areas and do it the right way for your company so that you can achieve those goals? No, I like that. Um, and we are thinking about those goals, especially in our role as CIO often, um, you know, we're, we're so focused on keeping the lights on and making sure, you know, when we're not at the table, it's often because things are going great. So how do you like, how do you insert yourself or how do you, how do you get, you know, you, the rest of your business partners, you know, to, to create, you know, those relationships? How, what do you do, Nate? Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I've been fortunate because I've worked with some, some, um, some very supportive peers as executives. And I think that really helps and in some ways is a requirement, but, you know, it begins with being part of the solution. And instead of being an accessory or, or a bolt on, you have a seat at the table and you're part of the conversation. And, uh, you know, sometimes I explain myself like, like, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm connected to the entire business in different ways. And so I'm having conversations about business processes and they're in areas that are far outside of IT, but I'm there to learn about them. And the more that I learn, the more opportunity I can find to add value. And so then when we bring the whole IT organization forward, you know, architecture, engineering, operations, we can support the, the more than day to day. We can support the strategic needs of the business and also enhance the day to day. Uh, you said keep the lights on, that we keep the lights on and focus on that in right. my business. That's a real thing. Yours, I, th I was hoping you would like, like appreciate that, that specific analogy, <laughs> considering yeah, you work for. Definitely. <laughs> 
and and you know there are considerations there too resilience is really important and so the decisions we make we make around that. yeah that makes perfect sense um and and so it sounds like you've got really healthy relationships uh within your organization especially at at that executive level um which is wonderful because that puts you at the right place the right seat on the bus to to help enable those things so when you're thinking then about transformation in your previous experience, what are some of then the biggest challenges? If you know if you do have those healthy relationships, that's a great like foundation. But what in your experience were some you know challenges or hard things uh, that you were faced with in, in your past? You know, I think the biggest thing in, in many forms is change resistance, and I mean that can be cultural resistance or fear fear of change, fear of the unknown, uh, rule uncertainty, um, process comfort. I mean, all those types of things. That's definitely the top of the list. And, you know, especially in, in businesses that are well-developed businesses that have, you know, that are mature and in, in their- um, Always have done it that way. Yes, of course. Yeah, and then being open to break that cycle and finding ways and creative ways to do that, that can be a challenge. Um, the other the other thing that I see too is the digital skill set. So um, when we're talking about digital transformation, the place where we're going is not that place where we are and you need to have different tools when you arrive. And you can't get them afterward. You have to build them on the way. And so helping those in the organization that will be a part of that path to develop those skills, um, find creative ways to do that. Uh, to use the talent that you have and, and, you know, give that talent that has served so well in other roles, new opportunities as a part of the future plan. Um, you know, we've, we did a lot of that in our process. Um, and then, you know, there are always the, the typical like budget challenges or keeping up with the pace of technology and return on investment. Those things, cybersecurity, of course, is very important. Um, but, you know, I think it's those, those kind of like, um, the people challenges that are the ones that are the hardest to work through. And sometimes, it, I mean, it's really rewarding when you do work through them and you can turn the corner because it shows it shows a, um, a huge change and growth in the organization. I want to pull a thread of something you said at the very beginning of your answer, and then you kind of were touching on it at the end. And you use the word fear. Um, mm -hmm. And I... It just made my brain go back and think about like what we went through with COVID and, you know, you know, for the first time as leaders in all kinds of ways, we were dealing with fear, which is a very individual experience. So talk to me more about this fear element, Nate. Yeah. So, so an interesting part of our journey is that we implemented an ERP. We did our transformation during COVID and wow. It, it began a little bit before COVID, but we were in a culture as an organization that didn't have a lot of remote work and we rapidly changed and we changed as a result of our transformation. We transformed infrastructure first and it, it just so happened that we had built the infrastructure to allow remote work and we hadn't utilized it until COVID happened. And we went in, in two days, we went to fully remote work. And at the same time, we were midstream in the beginning of an ERP. And so all of our teams were adapting to that change and just, I mean, fear in the whole world. Um, yeah. And as far as the cultural shift for us, uh, you know, I think um, the, the thing that was different was that we went from being this monolithic project that was the, we're not sure what this looks like at the end to a lot of people. Um, you know, those of us that were part of the team had a plan for that, but we went from that to how do we manage this differently? And I think in some ways, the experience of, of the remote work and COVID and, and just the uncertainty around us, it gave us the ability to shape out the future in a time where everything was up in the air. And so we kind of could take advantage of that to be successful for the company. And, um, you know, I think in those times, you know, there are those that, that, you know, they bury their head and they say, you know, this is scary. And there are others right. that step forward and they charge ahead. And we were the ones that were charging ahead saying, we can do this, let's get it done. And we were successful with that. I love it. I, I, you know, the word like rally, like you rallied together is popping in my head, you know, and you're right, you know, and, and so it is, uh, I think leaders who understand fear 
and and how to um, be empathetic, but also to your like you were saying, um, you, you know, you have to make lemonade out of lemons, right? So, you know, where yeah. are we? What can we do, right? Yeah, I think when you're when you're managing fear in a culture around technology, you know, part of the answer to that is trust, and uh, it's a hard thing to achieve, but you achieve it by putting um, putting some wins in the bank and by demonstrating that um, if you are following the process by design that you do get some of those wins. And so I know I saw this wonderful team that we had start to you know put a notch in their belt every time they had a win and the confidence grew and we got to a point where um, you know eventually we reached a go live and then you know things worked and we expected them to work. But a lot of the the question marks and the and the you know what ifs they start to go away when you're actually operating and when things are working well. And so you know there's there's no substitute for success. Success brings more success, and that confidence helps turn the tide with the fear. One hundred percent. Achieving results is always number one. And when you do that, um, then a lot of other things can fall into place a lot easier. So, Absolutely. Yeah, that's really good stuff. Um, so let's shift a little bit and, and maybe it, it was happening during this time as well for you. Um, but what about like when you're trying to do something innovative or a uh, creative or different within like transformation could be lift and shift. We're just moving something to one environment to another. And some people call that transformation. But what's the role of innovation and how does that play into either the planning or the ideation or or is it more agile for you guys along the way? How, how does talk to me a little bit about innovation, Nate? Yeah, so innovation takes different forms in different businesses. And mm -hmm. um, that term can be used a lot of different ways. And so the way that I view innovation is uh, from the, the technology organization's perspective. We're trying to find ways to add additional value uh, where we can bring efficiency, where we can um, you know, help our business operate better or meet a future need and do that in a new and different way. And um, you know, I think uh, how we foster that are through our delivery models. So by taking an agile DevOps approach, uh, that's helpful by having clear requirements about what it is we're working toward or what, what our business goals are, what our business wants to achieve. But as far as enabling the innovation itself, mm -hmm. there is a certain element of creativity. There is a certain element of openness to change or willingness to try, uh, failing quickly if you try something and it doesn't work. And so you know, we, we've tried to create a, a culture within our IT organization around those things. And we've had some successes with that, um, but I, I mean, I freely admit in the utility industry, we're not known for our rapid innovation and change, but we are in an industry that is changing rapidly and we're, where we will have to innovate differently than we have before. And I think that the IT organization is, is uniquely positioned to contribute to that and really help that business model evolve. Absolutely. And I love, um, and I just want to, in case, people didn't catch it. I want to try to summarize your definition of innovation. Um, and I think you said any change that adds or brings value, like right. sum it up shortly. Is that, would you say I captured it right? That's a great summary. Yep. I would like to pull the thread on like one of your stories because often, and, and thank you for being vulnerable. First off, admitting that sometimes it's difficult and sometimes it doesn't work. And I think some, if, if you're willing, often we learn the most from those stories. Can you think of a time where you did fail fast and that you guys learned something from it? Are you, if you're, if you're willing to share maybe a story along those lines? Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to think for a second because it Give is you a minute. It's fine. sometimes it's more difficult to share those kinds of stories, but it, it is. And it's okay. If you don't want to, we can always go to something else. <laughs> oh, I've got a great example actually. Okay. Um, so, very early on in my tenure, um, I was tasked with some systems improvements and I was taking too myopic of a view. And I was looking at major business systems, which is broad and massive, uh, but there was a, a mid-flight 
system implementation that was intended to be the solution in this, this particular area. And so my team led an implementation and it was almost like one of these um, against all odds, this implementation was embattled. We found a way to resurrect it and we made it the implementation go in, but it wasn't the right fit. And so, you know, the thing, the lesson from it is even though on paper, it was a system that went live and it met the requirements that were created. And, uh, you know, we had a we had a team that at the end said, yay, it's working and, and you know, we're all happy. Uh, over time, we realized, hey, that's not the right fit. And um, and so we very quickly, once we acknowledged that, had to plan for a replacement. And that replacement became our overall, it was one of the, the sparks for our enterprise systems modernization that became an ERP project. And so we, we shifted from the old model and the old approach and we said, we need to look at this more broadly. And so even though, I mean, it, it was a failed implementation, the success was that it set us up with a platform to, to do this entire transformation and modernization that really worked out well. Talk about really understanding your requirements after that, right? Absolutely. And and I know, I mean, you said fail fast. So there are different ways. I mean, emerging technologies fail fast may mean you try it that day and then you move on. Um, you know, some of these more iconic uh, business processes and systems, it may be a week or two, you know, I mean, then or a few weeks. That's what that looked like was we started to say, well, wait a minute, let's keep this conversation open. And then we were willing as a team uh, and as a company to say, hey, we need to we need to revisit this and do this better. I love that. I love that. And since you brought up emerging technologies, how the heck do you keep up, Nate? I mean, every like it seems like every day there's another flavor of it. A, I'll, I'll use the AI word. AI, or that, you know, it's popping up in some application that, you know, you know, that who would have thunk they would have put AI in, um, or, you know, you know, um, I can't even believe blockchain came across my uh, email this morning, but uh, that's kind of old, a little bit old school at this point. But how do you keep up with, you know, everything that's going on and keeping it relevant for like your community and who you're serving? So I think, you know, there's the pulse of the industry that we have to keep as CIOs mm -hmm. and there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's networking and um, tracking industry trends. And in my cooperative network, we have wonderful networking opportunities between companies. So we keep up on yes. some of those things that way. And cooperatives are unique in that sense. Um, but, you know, I think the the other thing that's a challenge is, you know, on the AI example, it's been changing by the day and by the week. And mm -hmm. so uh, really trying to understand what problem it is you're trying to solve and what solutions may be emerging in that space. And that mm -hmm. gives you a chance to, you know, if you choose to strike very early and find value and opportunity there. And, um, you know, we actually, we did that um, with a generative AI assistant where uh, we moved very, very quickly. Uh, we actually uh, have had uh, for over a year our AI assistant active. And so for our company, when we made that move, it was that we felt value was there. We felt that there was an opportunity for us uh, and we tested and we just, um, we felt that it was a time where we could catch the wave and start to serve. And it's worked out well for us. Um, but you know, it, it's really a challenge as as everything else evolves, right? You know, those daily advancements, if you're not keeping track of that, it's easy for things to pass you by. And I've had, I've heard some experts uh, say that in some of those waves, if you don't catch the wave, you'll never catch that set. The wave will be going and other people will be surfing it. And so you have to know which waves you want to catch and which waves you're willing to pass. That, I love that. I, you know, I love the wave analogy. You don't want to be too far in front of it because you're going to get crushed get your knee skinned up on the rocks. And to your point, I'd love that. Yeah. Or if you're not paddling enough, you're not going to catch the energy of that wave at all. And you're going to be stuck out there. Um, yeah. So it, it is that almost art of knowing exactly where to be on the wave. It is. You have to catch the right wave for you and you have to find the right place on that wave. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's really good. That's really good. So um, when you think of, you know, the, whether it's agility or innovation in your specific area, are you doing anything unique or 
or uh, special with that that you could share with others that they might learn from? You know, I think the things that we've done well most recently have positioned us for the AI boom. And so we, we drove early AI adoption here and it was as a result of a cloud transformation, an infrastructure transformation and an enterprise ERP implementation that really put us in place on a tech stack to take advantage of that. And once we did, it was like a wildfire. Uh, we didn't realize how far out in front we were at that time. And mm. I mean, if you look at the size and scope of our company and um, just the resources we have, um, we, we were doing things that we found valuable and kept pulling on a thread. And then we kind of came up for air and looked around and said, wow. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, I think that's exciting because it's fun to be in that place. Um, but it also is all built on a foundation of trying to do things that bring that value to the business. And, you know, I think I use that word over and over, but yeah. you have to, I mean, in, in my role, uh, you have to be committed to delivering that. And that's what helps us to, to be relevant and, you know, kind of be in the mix to help our companies do what we need to do. Um, you know, the thing that I would say just, you know, about what's different about us that way is that we were not encumbered with uh, fear. We believed and understood in how that AI technology worked. And, you know, having a, having a background as an academic, in addition to my practitioner background, helped me there. So it wasn't as much of a leap of faith for me. Um, but we also looked at it through a lens of cybersecurity, looked at, you know, what exactly were we trying to do? How would we derive that value? And then we were able to show a few different ways that we were able to do that. One of my favorite examples uh, is a, a RAG implementation uh, that we did for a power plant uh, where we were able to bring in all the manuals. It was a bookshelf full of old manuals. And whenever they do a maintenance window, it's critically important that they're able to reference that information quickly. And so we were able to go from, you know, a bunch of paper spread out on a table uh, twice a year for a few weeks to something they could have on a mobile device, have in, in, on every PC and wow. reference that material and make it very useful. So, you know, that's value when you can find something like that. That's great. Yeah, there are two themes here. We're talking about fear and value. And uh, when you take care of fear, whether it's addressing it or managing it so that people can feel safe to take on innovation and ultimately add value. So um, yeah, I love how this is going. So um, I would love to pick your brain and a telescope into the future. You could see into the future. What are you seeing, Nate? What, where are we going? Um, you know, what's what where's your imagination going with kind of we've come we've had so much disruption um since 2020 um whether it was the pandemic or it's ai what's next so if we're talking what technology is next i think it's quantum and i think quantum will bring capabilities that we've never seen before uh, to address computing needs that we probably don't even know we have right now in business yeah uh, there's a lot of potential in that technology and i think the potential exists uh, to help with some of the cybersecurity problems that we face as industries um, but even even more than that i think um, advanced computing needs and advanced computing capabilities are going to be part of that um, i also think that even though we're we're kind of in the beginning of the wave on AI and some people are predicting that, that we will uh, bottom out, you know, we'll get to a certain point and then people will start to focus on other things. I think there's a lot of capability in the pipeline there still. And so I think as um, the LLMs continue to advance and we start seeing more advances in small language models um, and just continued um, growth in terms of um, our data center capabilities and compute to support AI, mm -hmm. I think we're going to see AI as a solution in areas where maybe systems have been solutions before. And so I think there's a chance to really um, kind of uh, rapidly accelerate how we use that and the way that we access information. And so I think businesses are going to try to take a look at that and see if there's a way to take advantage of that. Um, so it's going to be, a, I think, a very interesting few years here because I could see an intersection. If you, if you get out, far enough and you can combine the, the computing capability of quantum 
and the advanced capability of AI for reasoning and logic and um, access to information, uh, we could we could see an acceleration unlike we've ever seen in history. Okay, so if I'm a lay person or a board person who doesn't have a technology background and you just said the word quantum, what the heck does that mean, Nate? So quantum is a, a change in the way that processing works. And, and so the advantage of quantum computing is that we're able to process more faster. And more um, faster. More yeah. faster. Yep. That's good. That's good. Just didn't want to lose all of our, I know some of our audience, so uh, what, uh, may not know all of these things. So uh, that, that was a good lesson. Thank you for that. Um, so how you, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about how you keep up and how your organization's doing and how they, um, handle transformation. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit and talk about your team. Um, how do you, from a leadership perspective, kind of what's your style and how do you bring them along on this journey? So I think anybody from my team that would talk to you, um, would probably say, um, I'm, I'm not the leader that is, you know, super vocal and, um, you know, highly over directive. Um, what I tend to try to do is I try to inspire shared vision and I try to explain the, the reason and logic for that. And I try to find very talented people and leverage their talents and support them. And um, sometimes that means removing barriers within the organization. Uh, other times it may mean just believing in them and, and showing them and helping them and giving them what they need to, to succeed. And I think that, you know, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a conductor or an orchestrator. Uh, but there are times where you also have to be the one that can rally and drive forward. And so um, sometimes I, I joke and I say, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like the Rocky Balboa of <laughs> IG because it takes grit and it takes tenacity. And, um, and during those times that, you know, if you can be that person, then you can inspire others and they will believe that you can conquer whatever the next challenge is. And so I think that's important, too. And so, I mean, there's a lot of different styles all together there, but I think the answer is really in being able to be flexible and understand the needs of your team and helping meet them where they have needs. And then, you know, figuring out how to tie it all together as that orchestrator or that conductor to, to help everybody go together toward where you need to be. Oh, I love that. The Rocky Balboa. I'm going to have to put that in the title. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so... Uh, you know, I always like to ask, um, you know, you, you've uh, had a lot of wonderful experiences. You obviously very accomplished, um, love your leadership style. I love our conversation on fear and on values and, and changing or using innovation to uh, drive value for the organization and, and um, trusting in your team, uh, all beautiful messages. Uh, but if you were to walk in to an ice cream shop, and I'm, on, I'm picking ice cream shop for you because I can't help it with Dairyland, I'm thinking ice cream. And I know I know it's a power cooperative, but can't help it, that's where my brain goes. Um, so you're in your ice cream shop and there you see your 21 year old self. Um, first off, what flavor of ice cream are you eating? And second, what would you, what advice would you give your younger self? So I would be eating Blue Moon ice cream Blue moon. And, yep. Blue yep. Moon. And the advice that I would give is always believe in yourself, even when it's hard. Find a way. You can be resilient. There's always a path. It's just a matter of how to find it. And so that's grit. I love it. Rocky Balboa, grit, finding the path adding value, addressing fear. This has been an awesome podcast. I really want to thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom and um, and being brave to, to, to share a, a fail fast story. Um, I really, uh, this has been a special time. Thank you, Nate, so much. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate your time and, and all of your thoughtful questions. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Until next time.